Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Chicago, 1966. Late one summer's night, nine young student nurses are viciously attacked and bound by a lone intruder who entered their accommodation. Eight would be tortured, brutalized, and murdered before sunrise. A ninth woman, Miss Corazon Amarau, escaped death as she crawled and hid under a bed while the assailant conducted unimaginable atrocities just next door. Amarau stayed hidden until 6 a.m., the only survivor, the only witness to the crimes. Providing vividly accurate detail on the assailant's appearance, composites are made, and the hunt for the man responsible for the crime of the century kicks into overdrive. Most notably, the individual in question bears an extremely distinct and astonishingly appropriate tattoo. Cut into the very same forearm that cut into eight lives that night are the haunting words, born to raise hell. And that he most certainly did. Hello and welcome back to I Could Murder, a podcast episode number five. I'm Tom Norris, of course I am, and he's Ben Carter, of course he is. Of course I am. Of course you are. Of course I You're am. You're not going to change that name, are you? Um, shouldn't have thought so. If you could, quick fire, quick fire round, what would you change it to? Mm. Biff Wellington. Um, quick fire round. Quick fire round. Um, if you don't, you're going to get stuck with whatever I give you. For the rest of your life. Guy Saparo. Guy Saparo. Yeah. What about you? Probably stick with my name. I'm quite happy, quite happy with it. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> just go stand firm and <laughs> just follow your heart. Stand firm and follow your heart. Mm-hmm. Solid advice, that. Thank you very much indeed. I live, I live by that every day. And for people that maybe don't but want more advice like that, why not follow us on our socials? Yeah. Because we, can... we don't post any advice like that on there, but maybe one day we will. At could murder a pod for all of your um, lifely advice. Well, no, because we do fact about murderers. Maybe not. Don't mm. follow that advice. Do the opposite of what we post about. Yeah, there you go. Advice to live by. Unless it's oh, can you support us on a Patreon? Because we want you to support us on the Patreon because it gets put back into gets put back into this product. You're keeping the lights on and the coffee hot in Boston Sound, and it truly is the lifeblood of the platform, as we said last week. Ben, I, had a co- I had a coffee the other day here, and it was lukewarm. Yeah. And I was so, like, they're obviously not supporting us enough on Patreon or on the store. Um, guys, we need hot coffee. <laughs> and these lights, oh my f***ing God. LED, so they're not actually that. They're quite yeah. cost-effective. Very valid point from Tom, and we have a whole library, a whole host worth. It'd be quite a small, it'd be a small library. I wouldn't get a library card for that library, if you know what I mean, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I wouldn't. Anyway, you're not here to hear us waffling on about Patreon and bloody Instagram, are you? Are no. you? If you are. Fantastic. <laughs> we'll carry on. Yeah. No, we won't carry on. We're going to be talking about our new case, the case of the week, and that is the case of Richard Speck. And what a case at that. Um, no other real nicknames. He's very nicknameable. I was disappointed not to find more names. Of is. Nick form. Well, he did. He did have a couple of names that were stuck well, getting given to him. Okay, so he, he for a period of time went by the Birdman. Yes, he went by also the Drunken Painter of Stateville. Pretty good name. So, do you want to apologise to Richard Speck? <laughs> or this, if initials wise, R Speck, respect. 
But the bad thing about Amit is he did not respect the law. No. And we're going to be talking about exactly how he ended up the way he did. Yeah, fascinating case. I mean, um, initially, the reason we picked this, we've seen him in uh, Mindhunter. We'd heard about the Birdman. Doesn't look like the character in Mindhunter. You know, no. like Ed Kemper was like bang on. Yeah. Um, Specs uh, actor doesn't look like him. The Charlie Manson one. Wow. Wow. Ooh, wow. I did a double take there. What? Surely just watching the screen, you just watch it. And then looked away and looked back. It's like, that's. Char- yeah. Char- that looks like Charlie Manson. <laughs> <laughs> look, <laughs> look away, look again. It's like, oh, he's gone. It's a different scene, Ben. Just watch it and it just follows a linear so, pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, the reason we picked it, there is some footage, and we will get onto this uh, towards the end of the case, but some bizarre footage of Richard Speck, which is one of the first pieces I found, you know, how I found out about this guy. And uh, it's haunting. It's, uh, it's very graphic. And um, we look forward to surprising you with that later. So Richard Benjamin Speck was born on December 6th, 1941 in Kirkwood, Illinois. Now, he was born, Tom, before a very big event. The, the, the day before a very big event um because a lot of quite things literally ha- a, lot, a lot of things happened after like f- f- off, <laughs> f- off. <laughs> that's the point that's the day before isn't it that's the big bit and i handed you it and I, I you hit shot it me no you didn't <laughs> speck was born the day before the japan sneak attack at pearl harbor speck said the day i was born all hell broke loose the next day it hasn't stopped since he does rate himself quite highly as a hellraiser does old mm. richard speck so richard was the seventh of eight children from benjamin franklin speck and mary margaret carbor um the couple uh you know Uh, big family they were struggling to make ends meet in a fairly modest household that they had Um, Benjamin would work lots of odd jobs and lots of hours during the day to make ends meet for the family yeah it was a very religious household Mary was very religious and very strict she didn't like any alcohol in the house or any drinking she was and once at a fish fry yeah Benjamin had a couple beers and he was very she was very cross about that she uh she had stern words with him in front of the whole neighborhood to put that beer down Benjamin Put it down now. There you go. I felt like I was there. Yeah. So with a full household of people, um, Speck did really enjoy his dad's company. He'd go on little fishing trips with him, have a, just a bit one on one time, and mm. that's the time when he felt as, as happy as Larry. Yeah, those were certainly the uh, happiest days of his life when he was one on one with his dad, fishing um, for bluegills, fishing for bluegills, hunting, camping, hiking, all sorts together. They loved the great outdoors. It just says just fishing. Specifically just fishing. Yeah. No, mm. Brackets definitely not hiking. Oh. And if anyone says hunting, they can go fuck themselves. <laughs> fuck. Who wrote this? Sorry, boys. That's all right. That's all right, mate. Oh. So, yeah, um, absolutely idolised his dad. Um, spent a lot of time together as and when they could. But, of course, the dad was trying to make ends meet, you know, where possible by working exceptional amounts yeah, of hours. Yeah, and, and he's putting his time between, you know, seven other children as well. So yeah. his dad had a very strong work ethic and he had good moral values. Probably earned the beer at the fish fry, I would say. Yeah, I think Mary could have maybe let him off that one mm. bit. So Mary was definitely in charge of, of the household. She ensured that the whole family uh, attended church every week and, and lived by very kind of Christian... Um, beliefs and and ways of life and then richard speck's happy world came crashing down in 1947 when his father passed away at the age of 53 from a heart attack after his father's passing it was very clear to students and teachers that it affected him greatly as he would regress back to being much younger he started whining acting out and even eating crayons during class so during one class they're watching a film and he sat upon the teacher's lap and one of the one of the students asked the teacher they said miss why is Richard sitting on your lap? And she said, oh, Richard Speck was acting like such a big baby. I couldn't think of a better place for him. Which is a bit odd. His sisters would dote on him, yeah. unlike his mother. His mother was quite distant to him. Yeah, the, the mother would remain distant for a, a, a large portion of Richard's life. So there was a fairly large age gap between Richard and his younger sister and the rest of the siblings. So the, the older siblings absolutely doted on him. They spoiled him and they went out of their way to protect him, whereas the mother was always quite quite distant i guess when you get to your seventh child it's like it's like a family on channel four there's, there's channel five i think it is the family of 20 kids or whatever i'm like you're not giving all those kids the same amount of love or attention it's just for you physically or time yeah 
same thing as attention, I guess, in a way. So Speck's mother would go on to remarry, and she seemed to go for the complete opposite to Benjamin Franklin Speck. A real character now enters the story. and uh, He looks like a villain. Yes. Yeah. He's the kind of person that would tie up someone to a train track. Yes, yes. And maybe have a rummage in their pockets whilst doing so. Wouldn't put it past him. It's Carl August Rudolph Lindbergh, and he was a travelling insurance salesman from Texas, whom she met on a trip to Chicago. So Lindbergh, when we say he's the polar opposite, he was hard drinking, he had a criminal record from forgery, several arrests for drink driving. So yeah, he just, in considering, you know, she's, she was very religious and very mm. strict, they seemed to be the polar opposite to... Um, yeah, to her previous husband. Yeah, and, and any time he went to a fish fry, he got fucking shit-faced. The thing is, as we said before, the family were very poor and they were struggling, and even with Benjamin working very hard. So this could be a case of the mum thinking, okay, this guy, you know, he's, he's very sure of himself. He's got some money. It might have been a move to just kind of like provide for her children. Like it was, yeah. she, she was, it was, she was left in a very hard position. Basically, is what yeah. I'm saying. So I'm not, you can't, you know. And as well, I guess if she, if she did, if she did fall in love with him, she fell in love with him. Yeah, you can't pick who you do he, that with. Exactly, you can't pick who you fall in love and with. And also, if he's got a rap, you know, a fairly long rap sheet, including a lot of fraud, you know, maybe he's a good manipulator. Maybe he's able to charm and uh, oh, definitely and seduce. A travelling insurance salesman literally sounds like the very kind of, you know, that kind of person. He also had a wooden leg. Yeah. Um, so Speck loathed his often drunken, frequently absent stepfather, who uh, he'd psychologically abuse him, insult him and threaten him. Um, Called him a gutter rat. Yeah, and he seemed to target Speck more than the others. A gutter rat is a very... A rat would do it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Why do you have to put a location on the rat? But Richard... Uh, he was quite a shy child as well. Yeah. He didn't talk, didn't talk very much. He, you know, he'd often like in class be very quiet. Um, so kind of having, you know, your homestead be associated with your father, your stepfather, sorry, um, picking on you, it would have been a hard childhood. Yeah. So this spiraled into a bit of an uncomfortable pattern for Richard. So he was obviously not the most successful student at school. Eating crayons probably didn't help. Um, but then the home life wasn't good for him either. So not getting a lot of time with, with the mother, not getting a lot of time with the teachers at school, and um, he's very unhappy in both locations. So Speck's eldest brother, Robert, died at the age of 23 in an automobile accident um, in 1952. Um, so the mother, yeah, losing, another, losing a child, losing a husband, it's a very hard time for her as well. And obviously the oldest brother. Um, two big male role models. Exactly, exactly that. And so he's lost these two people, and now he's stuck with Carl, the travelling insurance salesman from Texas. Um, he was very abusive, like we said. Speck's mother, uh, Mary, married Lindbergh on May 10th, 1950 in Palo Pinto, Texas. Speck remained living with his older siblings in order to finish second and third grade um, while his mother moved to Santo, Texas with Lindbergh. So she's kind of abandoned him there. So, yeah, so Speck would have a, a couple of years without his mother and eventually then relocate to Santo, Texas uh, to be with them and his stepfather, as well as the rest of the siblings. Um, the family would then go on to live at 10 different addresses in poor neighbourhoods over the next dozen years. I can't help but think that that may be influenced by the uh, constantly on the run, fraudulent, alcoholic stepfather. And Speck was also held back at school because he refused to speak in front of the class as he didn't like people staring at him and required glasses but refused to wear them. Another, I, I oh. guess the name Speck yeah. and wearing glasses, you just, you, you You're just, asking for it. You are. You yeah. really are. Around the, the same time. Because um, of Specs, Spectacles, Richard Speck. Oh, those Dickie Specs. It could have been that. Carry on. <laughs> um, at around the same time. Kids can be cruel. That's all I'm saying. At around the same time, um, as well as dropping out of school, Richard would also abandon the church. And uh, apparently, according to a, a much older Speck, um, it just sounds funny. Go on. No um, according to a much older spec, um, he the reason he was he dropped out or was forced out of the uh, church was when introduced and it kind of links to him not liking people looking at him. Uh, the preacher introduced him to the congregation and said, um, "We have a new face in in the, in the service. I'd like you to pick three hymns that you'd like to sing." And he gets up and goes, "Him, him, him." him. him. <laughs> 
Speck started drinking alcohol at the age of 12, and by the age of 15, he was getting drunk almost every day. His first arrest in 1955 was at the age of 13 for trespassing. But um, after that, there'd be lots and lots of other misdemeanors who get arrested for over the next eight years. Um, he dropped out of school on his 16th birthday. Yeah, and there are photos of him at 12, um, and um, then there are photos of him as like a late teenager, and he looks like he's aged a whole lifetime during that period. Yeah, he does. He, he he seems to jump from being 12 to, to 40. Yes, almost immediately. Yeah. Um, he would hang out with some older older children and as well, you know, you get those weird weird people that hang out with young kids at that stage and he would, you'd eat, you know, he'd sleep with a couple of them and he would yeah. even start, um, he'd start seeing um, sex, sex workers work. as well at a very, very young age. Jinx, I don't know if she was working that, that night, um, but she, she would go see them at a very young age. At the age of 15, seeing a sex worker seems... Well, I mean, it's surely illegal for the uh, sex, sex worker to... to see yeah, but up, but. this is what, the 50s, the 60s? After dropping out of school and kind of abandoning uh, religion, um, Speck would continue to foster a great deal of hatred towards his um, alcoholic criminal stepfather. And to get back at him, he would rob his liquor cabinets. The weird thing is, obviously, as we said, he's lost his brother, lost his father, the two strong male f- role models. Even though he has obviously has a hatred towards Carl, mm-hmm. he does go on to mimic a lot of his behaviours. Yes. I mean, yeah. it could be said that, because I don't think Carl was very faithful as well, sex yeah. workers, um, forgery, which is that forgery is something that happens in Rich Speck's life quite a lot. Yeah. Even things like a $3 check. Yes. Which is <laughs> just, yeah. yeah. Um, so Check for Speck. By the age of 15, he's obviously immersed now in uh, this t- kind of tough, older crowd. He's He's... He's um, indulging in all sorts of, um, uh, well, slightly criminalized behavior. Um, He's been introduced to drugs, sex workers, and uh, he now begins to carry a switchblade on him at all times, um, which he uses to both threaten people and pick locks on windows. Yeah, he apparently was a very good and handy thief. And he, he liked to consider himself as a tough guy, but apparently without the knife... He was very, you know, he wasn't very sure of himself, but with the knife in the hand, which is something which is called his 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 insurance policy later on. And he becomes known in the area as a fairly petty criminal, um, but one that, you, you know, frequently commits different crimes. And we don't mean by that he's just stealing Tom Petty CDs. Yeah. Because <laughs> he wasn't around then. Um, he also, uh, you know, continues to drink alcohol at a very, very regular level. Um, He's been uh, charged with drunken disorderly, indecent exposure, burglary and shoplifting uh, on numerous occasions at this point. And he's still only kind of 15, 16. So 1960 onwards then, he uh, he lands his first job and it's with the 7-Up company. Whilst holding his job with 7-Up, he would meet uh, 15-year-old Shirley Annette Malone. Speck was 19 at the time. I told you this was going to get a bit... Hmm. At the Texas State Fair. Yeah. She became pregnant just three weeks after the pair had met. Um, and yeah, they married in January 19th, 1962. Yeah, so I'm not sure of the age of consent in Texas, 1960. For the top of my head, Ben, can't tell you. Um, but yeah, that age gap is is slightly yeah worrying to see in, in today's... With today's eyes, definitely. Um, so yeah, she, she fell pregnant very early on in their relationship and they had a child together called Robbie Lynn Speck. Yeah. And again, <clears throat> kind of mirroring perhaps the stepfather here, it's, um, a fairly turbulent relationship and it's said that Speck on numerous occasions would drive out, pick up sex workers, drive back to their house and start kissing them and fondling them in front of the, uh, wife. Well, and then he'd laugh at her and then drive off. Some people. Speck is believed to have a thing called the Madonna Whore Complex, which, some, that being a term, is, is, is an odd term, which was first identified by Sigmund Freud. And this is a psychological complex, and it is said that men develop who see women as either saintly Madonna or debased sex workers. Men with this complex desire a sexual partner who have been degraded while they cannot desire their respected partner. So they want, they, they desire the person who they, they look as being lower than them where such men love, they have no desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. So respect with, you know, his wife, the the, the woman of his child. Um, he he didn't desire that, but um, he didn't. Yeah, he couldn't mix those two worlds together. It's it's it's, it's a very complex. Uh, yeah, 
So when their daughter, Robbie Lynn Speck, was born in 1962, Malone did not know that Speck was serving a 22-day jail sentence for disturbing the peace in McKinney, Texas, after a drunken melee. Yeah. and it, So that just shows the, com- the communication there is it's fairly poor. Yes. Uh, the following year, Speck was again caught after he forged and cashed a co-worker's $44 paycheck. Um, he also robbed a grocery store, making away with cigarettes, beer, and $3 in cash. Um, which again, I mean, even in 19, so this is 1963, three dollars is what usually we do this. We're like in today's money, that's an awful lot of money. Three dollars now is six quid ish. Speck was also convicted of forgery and burglary, and he was sentenced as a result of this to three years in prison, which we'll get onto when he commits some some slightly more serious crimes and gets given much lesser punishments. Um, A three-year sentence at the time was very harsh. Um, And again, this is possibly learned behaviour from the stepfather because he's carrying out exactly the same traits as, um, as Lindbergh. Speck was paroled after serving 16 months in the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas. So during this time, Speck would move around, the, move around between his um, siblings' houses, houses, going over there, staying around there, lending, them, lending him money. As we said, they used, used to dote on him. Yep. And there's a picture of his siblings minus him, and they look like a really normal, happy family. Yeah. And then and he, he just doesn't look like part of the family at all. Like he is yeah. v- visually, he doesn't look like he's, <clears throat> he's part of the family. And he's very, he is very much a loner, but even though he is a loner, he requires and he needs his support all the time from his family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless, um, but then he didn't like being the centre of attention at school or at church and uh, essentially, I would imagine, potentially, I would imagine the uh, the family dynamic as well. So it's not like he's going out of his way to get this attention. But then he, then he grows up, he gets arrested a lot. His mum his mum as well, who, you know, who wasn't very doting on him, she's coming out and bailing him out all the time. Mm. And even one of these stints in, in prison, he ends up getting a tattoo, saying, born to raise hell. Yeah. Which... For someone who doesn't like attention, that's, you know, he, that in that kind of era as well, tattoos weren't really no. that prevalent. It was a very much a prison prison thing. There's a couple of photos of him, like almost a, ta- uh, photos you would see in like an old rockabilly tattoo magazine. Um, and he's there. I can't tell if he's in a barber shop or if he's getting tattooed, but it's like some sort of fashion shoot. Um, so it's a really interesting image of Speck. One week after Speck was paroled, um, he was caught wielding a 17-inch carving knife. I mean, that's a big that's a big loaf of bread, Ben. I guess you didn't carve bread, do you? Hmm. Well, but maybe Speck did, and that's the thing. And that's one heck of a turkey he's carving, Ben. Yeah, 17 inches. <clears throat> yeah, that's um. For the, that. for the audio listeners, Ben's roughly got 17 inches width. Thank you. Roughly uh, between his hands. Thank you again. <laughs> and, the, and the guys just left. <laughs> Bigger than a bread bin. So yeah, <clears throat> so Speck was caught wielding a 17-inch carving knife um, where he attacked a woman in a parking lot of her apartment building. Now, Speck immediately fled after she started screaming. However, the police were able to arrive within a few minutes and apprehend him, which is good policing. Yeah, the, the thing about Speck, like we say, he's very... It's got a lot of character if you look at him. He, he was quite, very, quite tall. The slick back hair, the dirty blonde hair, as people say. And a term that we kept hearing on listening to the documentaries was pockmarked face. Pockmarked face, which essentially is yeah, like scars from picking spots. So yeah, essentially the like acne scars. So he, he was very recognisable, very distinctive, especially with the tattoos and whatnot. Yeah, Speck was uh, obviously apprehended and later uh, convicted of aggravated assault and given a 16 month uh, sentence to run concurrently and he was returned to Huntsville prison so first off there 16 months for carrying threatening someone with a, a 17 inch blade that's less than the inches of the knife yes there is definitely that but also that's almost half the time he was sentenced to for um, stealing beer cigarettes and three dollars that could be an accumulation though in that in that place can it? if he was constantly doing petty crimes Potentially. But you know, that does, I'm not saying that that makes sense. They're still wild that it was so short. Yeah, unlike the carving knife. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Dan, uh, it was a big knife, Dan. So due to a uh, clerical error, they thought it was a parole violation rather than a new crime and let Speck off early. 
And the thing is, he was so basically he would have had to have served another year. Yeah, honest. But and, and within this year that he would have been serving, mm-hmm. this crime that we're here to discuss happens, and it's a big crime. So it's just it's a big clerical. Check, always double check error, especially if you're in charge of looking Richard at the bad guys. Speck. Always check Richard Speck. Then there was this rhyme was going around at the time, and they didn't check. Always check Richard Speck. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was basically a big clerical error, which would lead to a horrendous thing. So after his release from prison, Speck worked for three months as a driver for the Patterson Meat Company. However, during this three month period, he had six car accidents. That is a lot. I mean, he, as we said, but he was carrying his drinking. He was taking these things called red birds, which is a, a little red pill. Um, he was yeah, he wasn't obviously taking employment seriously. But six accidents. Mm-hmm. After third and fourth, you're like, maybe let's let's move Richard into the into the stock room. <laughs> We're sending them out with these, you know, this with these uh, lamb chops, and they, they're getting them and they're turning into mints. <laughs> maybe that's what they said. I don't know. I wasn't there. So six accidents with his truck in three months, um, but he wasn't fired for any of the accidents. He was fired for no showing. Um, so he failed to turn up. They, they dismissed him. Now there was an interesting kind of turn of events now, and he does, he does lead a very interesting life until he chooses to go the way that he went. Um, now after his, uh, early release, um, his, his family, again, looking out for him, trying to find him work, trying to get a roof over his head. Um, what type of work would you suggest Richard Speck go for after all these issues we've discussed so far? Something quick, something easy. Oh, okay. Let's, uh, maybe, maybe a carpenter. If he's got if he's, carpenter. a carpenter, if he's got, you know, knife skills, he could maybe come carve, carve down or oh, tree surgeon. Yeah. That's actually very good. Thank you. He's quite tall as well, Ben. So I think he could reach the, the tall branches. <laughs> So um, I wish his mother saw it the same way, but unfortunately she didn't. And she put him forward for an au pair role. Or an au pair one. Oh, an au pair role. <laughs> Keep that in. You tell me what yours does and I'll tell you what an au pair. <laughs> That's not an au pair. This is an au pair. So Speck moved in with a 29-year-old divorced woman who was also an ex-professional wrestler. Um, she was a bartender at his favourite bar, Ginny's Lounge. Um, and needed someone to babysit their three children. The um, thing about which we haven't really covered is Speck, although he was, you know, a petty thief and he put, committed these crimes, um, he was a very smooth talker. He was, yeah. he had, he had, had the charm. He could talk. Southern draw. So yeah, he had that as well. And he was able to talk himself out of situations. And yeah, and that's probably how he kept his job for so long. And yeah, he was able to make friends fairly easily. Yeah. So I think like him. You know, he didn't display probably display any behaviour for her to worry about, and, and she probably she's probably working as a bar and as as a wrestler. She's probably met a lot of bad guys in the time, mm-hmm. so she probably thought and she saw Richard and she thought he was an all right guy, fairly harmless without the knife. Hmm? There you go. And apparently, there wasn't a speck of dust when he lived there. <laughs> Very tall, good reach, feather duster. So, um, in January of 1966, Shirley Malone filed for divorce, and Richard Shirley was- not. She, she, she surely did. As a result, Speck became irate. Absolutely livid he was. A livid Speck. And um, whilst drinking at a local bar, he got into a scuffle, which resulted uh, in Speck pulling a knife out. I don't know if it was a 17-inch one or not. And stabbing a man in a bar fight at Ginny's Lounge. Um, he was charged with aggravated assault, but a defence attorney hired by his mother was able to get the charge reduced to disturbing the peace. That is crazy. Good lawyer. Very good lawyer. Uh, Speck was fined $10, which I've heard he refused to pay, and jailed for three days after he failed to pay the fine. Uh, and this was the uh, the last time that Speck was uh, in police custody in Dallas. He decides now he needs to get out of Texas fairly quickly. So Speck then purchases a 12-year-old car. That sounds like you were saying it's a toy car. So Speck then... <laughs> so Speck then basically buys an old banger. Yeah, 12 years old apparently. Well, the following evening he robs a grocery store. He stole 70 cartons of cigarettes and essentially starts selling them out of the back of this beat-up old car. Um, he sold them out of the trunk of his car in the very same grocery store's Parking lot. That is wild. Some nerve. Some Bad nerve. Bad business sense. And at a marked up price. Just going to the shop and buy a cheap one. Yeah. 
That's my advice for anyone that bought cigarettes from Richard Speck in the car park of a grocery store they robbed recently. Good advice. Thank you. Find us on at Could Murder a Pod for more similar life advice. Um, the police traced down Speck and issued a warrant for his arrest for burglary on March 8th, um, which would have actually been his 42nd arrest. Ooh. He hadn't even been alive that many years. Police come to get him and essentially Speck tells him, I'll be back in a minute, I just need to go and get something. So he uh, ditches the car and gets on a bus to Chicago. Back to Illinois. Um, and he moves into the Christie Hotel in downtown uh, downtown Monmouth. Spends most of his time there bar hopping, drinking with locals, um, where he was eventually arrested uh, for getting in another bar fight. So he's living out of hotels in uh, in Chicago. Um, got into the same old habits in terms of drinking uh, and going on different bar hops, bar crawls. Um, and on April 3rd, Mrs. Virgil Harris, who was a 65-year-old resident of Monmouth, returned home at 1am to find a burglar in her house brandishing a knife. He was a six-foot-tall white man who was very polite and spoke with a southern draw. Um, the man blindfolded her, tied her up, raped her, ransacked her house and stole the $2.50 she had earned babysitting that evening. It was never proven, though highly suspected to have been spec. Yes. Highly suspected. Suspected. Spected. Spec. Oh, uh, okay. To have been Richard Spec. And 11 days after that, on April 13th, a barmaid in his local tavern, Mary K. Pierce, was brutally beaten to death. He managed to deflect police questioning and escape once again. But police discovered some of Harris's personal effects in his vacant hotel room. Yeah, and her body was found in an empty hog house behind the tavern that they were drinking in. And apparently, Richard Speck had helped to build the hog house. Uh. So while the police were searching Speck's room, and Tom mentioned they'd obviously found some of her personal items in his room, Speck left the building with suitcases um, and saying that he was just heading to the laundromat and he'd be back. He does seem like a bumbling... Petty yeah. crook. He just managed to blag his way, bumble away, and the police just kind of, we've just missed him. It's like, <laughs> why, I oughta? Oh, sorry, Chief. I saw him in the elevator on the way down. You what? You idiot. It's, it just seems to be very kind of slapstick how they police in this situation. But Slap Speck. Um, that does not work in no. any way. Speck then opts to move in. He basically now wants to leave the life of crime behind him. He, he's, he's, all, he's all run out of... He's all... Um, must be tiring getting arrested that many times. He wants yeah. to just go, I just want to know a hassle-free life. Yeah. I want to just go on the straight and narrow. Although the police are fairly easy to fool at this point, um, I, you know, I'm tired. Uh, so he moves in with, with his older sister, Martha, and her former Marine husband, Gene Thornton, and their two young children. Um, Speck told them an unbelievable story um, about his sudden arrival, suggesting that a previous... Uh, crime syndicate had been trying to force him to sell drugs which was something that richard was not willing to do mm. nor had the values to do um so he fed them a load of bullshit and um and and basically was refusing to sell drugs for this crime syndicate um so gene thornton who seems like a fairly nice guy in this story um suggests that he uh could get suitable employment for spec with the marines um the merchant marines um, and that uh, based on his background, he could pull some strings and essentially get Speck um, uh, on the straight and narrow. So he took Speck to the US Coast Guard office to apply for a letter of authority to work as an apprentice seaman. Yes. Um, on the boat, he would uh, carry on drinking, carry on taking his Redbirds. Um, oh, he has often seen a quart of vodka. Yeah. He, um, as, as seemed to happen, uh, drama would always follow him uh, he, he would uh, quarrel with lots of his his fellow uh, the fellow sailors and he would, he'd also expose himself to a few members yeah mostly he, senior officers as well he fell in he fell off the boat a few times what do you do with the drunken sailor um, and then apparently the final straw was that he pulled a knife on a superior yeah it's like he's like how can I get fired okay the drinking is not doing it falling off the boat's not doing it yeah. I got my knob out still not fired <laughs> I'll get I'll get my knife out to my captain and yeah that, that that was enough to get him. He was on there for a while and that another story was a case of he was on there and he was hunched over because he had appendicitis. Yeah, and yeah. if he wasn't, he was an hour away from dying apparently. But they took him back and they, you know he got he got help there during his time in the hospital. There he really enjoyed the attention of the doting nurses. 
as part of his application to get into the Marines and work on on, on the various vessels, um, a robust application had to happen, including fingerprints being taken for spec. So it's important we mention that part. Um, so the application required being fingerprinted and photographed. Um, and apparently spec loved the camera. Did he? Apparently. When, when he was in the uh, in the hospital, he loved being doted on by the nurses. I don't know if it's a throwback to his childhood, being doted on by his sisters, but he really seemed to enjoy that time. He would then obviously go to, once his appendix had been removed, uh, to try and get back on various vessels, ver- you know, land various roles. And every time he seemed to arrive, and this could just be because word had spread of his behaviour, but every time he arrived, oh, I'm really sorry, we've we've given it to this guy. Yeah. Gonna, and he always tended to go to someone slightly more superior. It's like in The Simpsons, the No Homers Club. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly like that. Yeah. I mean, that's probably what I used to I'm thinking about it. Yeah. So Spec basically couldn't catch a break, couldn't find any other roles um, in, in any any of the ships. Um, and so went back to Marfa and eventually outstayed his way, welcome with them as well. They'd been very kind of caring and understanding and they'd given him money and they'd given him opportunities with these, these different uh, employment roles. Um, but they basically said enough was enough and he was then dropped off. It seems to be with Spec, he needs the bare minimum. He's happy and content as long as he's got enough money to buy some booze. Yeah. He do, he doesn't he hasn't got that ethic work ethic in him which his father had. Yes, yeah. Um but he, as we said before he's forging things, he's getting drunk, he's he, he's blagging his way through life very much like his stepfather who he hated yeah. so much. That's it. That's it. So again, yeah, he's he's kind of it's learned behavior, isn't it? What we seem to be seeing. Yes, it, yeah. It's, it, I don't know if it was some form of <clears throat> payback cuz you know he was very upset with his mother for for marrying Carl. Um if it was a kind of F you to the world. I even think, you know, him getting that tattoo, he wanted to be the big bad boy. He wanted yeah, to be yeah. known for that. But as we said, once he didn't have a knife on his hands, he wasn't that guy. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they they didn't just abandon him. They they gave him $25, which is way more than he ever forged, you know? Yeah, that's, that's easily now, nowadays, man. It's probably, yeah. what, like 42 quid? Yeah, exactly right. So Ish. What, so what did he do? I think you can guess what he did with that 42 quid. Some red birds and some a quarter liquor, please. There you go, straight to the bar. So he would, uh, after being dropped off by Martha and her husband, um, he would spend um, a few nights um, sleeping in unfinished houses and drinking during the day. Um, and after saying goodbye to his sister, he spent the rest of the day drinking. Um, and he then accosted Ella May Hooper at knife point um she was a 53 year old woman who had spent the day drinking in the same taverns as spec yeah he spent the day kind of following her he, he saw she, her drinking early on in one of the early bars followed her from bar to bar to bar and um, it's not rinsing been... through that 42 quid exactly and he's it's, it's not he hasn't approached her apparently he's just following her from afar and waiting for his time to pounce spec ends up taking um LMA Hooper to his room at the shipyard inn where he then proceeds to rape her and he also stole her black $16 mail order 22 caliber ROM pistol which looks $16 yeah after the act Speck then returned to the very same bar he was drinking in where he started telling locals exactly what he had just done mm. and I think they just viewed him as that kind of local pisshead that rocked up to the bar and had a load of elaborate stories but never believed it was true um, and and no one followed it up, and uh, he had another drink. And I guess you wouldn't. Um, if someone comes up to you and says that, a you want them to just get get away, and you just think, why why would they tell me that? He's just saying this. It's just it's yeah. Just, why would you yeah. say that to a stranger? But I guess the lesson there is always report if someone says they could have gone and raped someone and stolen their gun. Yeah, and remember the famous rhyme: always check Richard Speck. There you go. So Speck. Uh, would return to Shipyards Inn and have a, a, another few drinks uh, until 10.20pm when he left dressed entirely in black and armed with a switchblade and LMA Hooper's German handgun. Again, I'm, I'm assuming it's German. He then walks 1.5 miles west to a townhouse located on 2319 East 100th Street, uh, which happens to be uh, essentially a, a dorm room. Um, for a number of student nurses. Now, whether he knew this or not is kind of um, it's been up a, for debate. It's been alleged that he possibly had kept an eye on the area. Yeah. And this, and we're now we're at the night which made Richard Speck infamous 
and and America's most wanted man. At 11 p.m. on July 13th, 1966, Speck broke into 2319 East 100th Street townhouse at Chicago's Jeffrey Manor neighborhood. The townhouse was functioning as a dormitory for student nurses. So Speck targeted this townhouse. He broke through the window at 11 p.m. and made his way to the bedrooms. Um, so at this time, the nurses were sleeping. They had to shift the next day. No one's sure if he knew how many people were in there, yeah. if he was expecting that many people. As we said, it's a bit, some people think, allude to the fact that he was monitoring the space and he knew that his women live in there because, I mean, spec it's a bit, a bit of a coward, like we said. He's not really yeah. one to fight, back himself in a fight or anything. Was he full of Dutch courage as well? Had he had a fair amount to drink that evening? Well, I imagine, um, drugs. imagine no, yeah, no, in spec, yeah, I imagine he probably, probably definitely had. Um, so spec having broken through the window obviously it's a it's being you kind of the townhouse is being used as a dormitory so there's a big corridor lots of different rooms um he knocks on the first door um and a filipino exchange student and uh and student nurse who would also be the the lone survivor um greets him and at gunpoint spec quickly herds her along into another room um, and he gets two additional uh, student nurses into that room with her which is uh, Melita Gargulo and Valentina Passion um, so he has three in the room at this point and another three are still asleep at this point he goes to wake them up and he now has six all in the same room but apparently he was quite calm and, yeah and he he made the women all sit around him as yeah. he kind of just smoked, smoked a cigarette and, and kind of, you know, talked to them one by one. He spoke to them as if he was at the bus stop, but he was, they were all sitting there. He does the trick he did previously. He cuts up the bed sheets. He binds their hands and legs so they can't escape. The nurses were saying, if we keep, you know, if we keep calm, if we keep quiet, if we speak to him, if he's talking to us and he seems calm enough, that's a good sign. So they're, 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 um, they thought, you know, he's just a drunk. He's, he's a Probably smelled criminal. the alcohol on him. Yeah, and thought, you know, he, we'll just have to kind of deal with this and he'll leave, he'll rob us, and then, then that's that. Yeah. And Speck was kind of explaining that that was what he was there to do. You know, he was only there to, apparently he was still, you know, talking to them in quite a charming, calm way with his uh, southern droll. He um, explains he's going to uh, take money. He's got plans to be in New Orleans. Um, so begins to ransack the place, look through different drawers. Uh, but it takes a slight turn when two other student nurses um, arrive at the uh, at the home. So Speck had taken the nurses one by one into different rooms and just when he was about to, um, it seemed something shifted in his head and he, he suddenly got a bloodlust and he decided he, he was going to kill. He, he didn't want any witnesses, he was going to kill. Just when it was just that, when that was about to happen, two more nurses came in to, um, to came into the dormitory. First came Suzanne Farris, who st he Speck stabbed to death in the upstairs hallway as she was walking to her room. The second was Mary Ann Jordan, who Speck also stabbed upon the entry to the house. Um, whilst Speck was taking these uh, nurses to the room, and as I said, like it was six people, then he got more people up, then there was two people came in. Amaral, uh, she basically hid under a bed. She went underneath a bed, stayed under there, so as quietly as she could. She could hear the other nurses being led to different rooms, so she said she couldn't hear them screaming, and it like big struggles, mm -hmm. but she heard muffled cries. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely chilling trying to imagine what she must have gone through because she was she was under there for what six or seven hours. Did well, she was up there and she was under there till five thirty in the morning the next yeah. day. So yeah, it, yeah, six hours and hearing her her classmates, her colleagues, her friends getting stabbed, get, getting killed. Um, you can only imagine how, how refined that would be. Because that's like the classic scene out of a, a horror movie when someone's got you know that camera view of someone under. You just yeah. see foot footsteps. And one thing which I don't know why I find this haunt like so haunting was after every time he went and killed someone, he'd go and wash his hands, and then go to the next one. He, he yeah. cleaned himself up between each one. He he saved one nurse till last, though, didn't he? Yes. He said so. He saved one student nurse until the very end, uh, which was Gloria Jean Davy. And there's, there's a horrible interview of, of Speck when he's in prison and he's recounting and he explains yeah. the reason why she was left to the end because because she was flirting with him, is what he said. Which, I mean, obviously that is obviously not the case. He 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 kept her her alive for a while longer. He raped her, sodomized her, and then he eventually killed her as well. It's um, in in the same interviews to, uh, Tom is referencing. Um, he claims, you know, when they're asking why he did this, he just states it wasn't their night. Yeah, he says it's so cold. And yeah, so matter of fact. But I don't know if he's saying that kind of to flex in front of the other prisoners, as if as if he as if he's not been affected by it. it, it but then he does. He does seem that way. It seems like he's he's yeah. you know, he's yeah. But I mean, 
as we were saying, Amaral, she stayed under the bed until 5.30 in the morning. She started hearing the alarms going off. Yeah. And that's when, and she's waiting to, she thought might, the spec might come back in there because yeah, of that. The alarms. Obviously, she's still terrified that he might remember that she was there because he was, the, she was the first one that greeted him. Yeah. Um, but then she realized after a certain time, okay, it's, but at six o'clock, the final alarms were going. She could, she could hear other people like <clears throat> kind of outside. So yeah. she thought, this is my moment, I'm going to run, scream, yeah. scream to the people outside. Now, with Spec as well, obviously, I'm, I, they don't know if he, he'd realised that there were eight in total or um, or where he was quite there, if, if he was drunk, if he was high. But also in saying that, um, you know, and it was dark as well, um, but these eight nurses, they're all brunettes. They're all of a fairly similar age group. And when you put the photo up of, um, of all eight uh, victims, um, you know, it's... it's, it's I'm looking at it now that's that they're all very similar looking yeah yeah I mean obviously as you said he's drunk it's dark as well um, and it's so um, in such a horrible situation one person surviving and having the you know the eyewitness she saw him she, she he threatened her with a gun she saw him saw exactly what he looked like he left there thinking he, he committed the perfect crime yeah um, which yeah was very much not the case and that's it I mean obviously for, for us we've seen him in Mindhunter um, the clip that we're about to talk about um, of Speck in prison is kind of what drew us to this case but I always thought he was a serial killer that specifically targeted nurses over a, like a prolonged period of time I never yeah. realised it was all in the same night and you know he's, uh, instead of that he's now a, a mass murderer or a spree killer rather than a serial killer definitely so Amaral, when she eventually decided you know, this was a time to get up and alert people, she went to the nearest window, she opened it, she screamed from the window, they are all dead, my friends are all dead, oh God, I'm the only one alive. It, yeah, again, to try and imagine that that kind of situation, it's just, uh, yeah. As you said, when you know, hearing about the, the nurses he's killed, all, all happened in such a short period of time. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, yeah, and it, the thing is, Respects crimes. They've just seemed to, from forging a three dollar check to this, it's, selling cigarettes out the back of the banger. Yeah, it's just and it's just gone on, gone on to this. And as we said, that um, clerical error, he would have still he would have still been in prison. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, absolutely shocking. Um, and uh, you know, all these young girls, obviously in a profession where they're helping people, caring yeah. for people. Um, they've all, you know, all in their early 20s as well. So the eight victims were Gloria Jean Davy, who was 22, Marie Ann Jordan, who was 20, Susan Suzanne Farris, who was 21, uh, Valentina Passion, who was 23, um, Patricia Matusek, who was 20, Melita Gargulo, who was 23, Pamela Wilkening, who was 20, and Nina Schmael, who was 24, um, all of whom died that night in yep. July. It's very sad. And as you said, like people who th who were there to, to help. And, uh, you know, Speck had such a lovely time on that ward being doted to on by those nurses. And then he goes and does does that. It seems very, very bizarre. No Richard Speck case is complete without mentioning this guy, Joe Cummings, who was a reporter and very quickly on the scene when Amaral started screaming. Um, he's in one of the documentaries that we've watched and it, he has to be seen to be believed. Um, so this is what he said when trying to describe um, Amaral. It was just like seeing a little girl who lost her mommy or something. She was just... I find it very reminiscent to that guy who's explaining to the news camera about the dog. <laughs> And he looks kind of like him as well, without the beard. There's something about him which is very similar. Yeah. Um, and then he would also then go on to uh, try and explain um, the scene because police allowed him to get into the house as well and like walk around. Um, there was one police officer with him. He basically was explaining to this uh, kind of... It sounded like the, po the police officer who first got there was just frozen and completely overwhelmed. So this reporter gets in and goes, you've got a homicide. Um, and then starts to explain or try to re-explain re to this uh, in this documentary of the, the scene that he was in. And he was like, well, you've, you've got a body here. You've got uh, you got two bodies. No, one body. And he just couldn't. So Jack Wander, who was the first homicide detective, 
on the scene said that Amaral, without her, without her identification, we wouldn't have nothing. That's it. She was a petite little girl, you know, but she, what she went through is unbelievable. Because obviously she had a very clear sight of spec. Mm -hmm. She was able to give that to the police. Yeah. And like we said before, he's a very recognisable character. Yeah. And the composite that they drew up, she recounted his um, his tattoo as well. Very identifiable features. Yeah. You could put, if, you put that in, if you put that in the newspaper, we're looking for this guy. Yeah. He's this tall. He's got the marks on his face. He's 17 the, inch knife. The tattoo. Um, all those things. It, it's a very. He's like a bit of like, like we say, he's a bit of a caricature of a person. He has, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, fingerprints were found at the scene uh, that matched uh, Spec from his semen days. Uh, two days after the murders, uh, a composite based on Amaral's description um, was uh, obviously broadcasted heavily. And it's, it's, it's a very good uh, composite of him. Um, uh, Speck was then identified by a drifter named Claude Lunsford. Um, so uh, he was a man that had been drinking with Speck um, and he'd identified him. They were both staying in the same hotel as well. They'd been drinking on the fire escape of the Star Hotel. Um, Lunsford recognised him based on the sketch and uh, immediately called police. After calling police, um, he returned to the room and found that Speck was gone. So the police uh, didn't follow up. Um, we think that's possibly down to the fact he was also a fellow drifter and a, and a drinker. They yeah. thought that, you know, that we're looking for someone here. We're not going to waste our time with, with that. But um, yeah, if they did, yeah. In any case, I think Lunsford makes it clear to Speck when he later sees him that he has called the police and um, Speck then begins to panic. And there again is a lot of conjecture with this. So in Mindhunter, the guy that's playing Speck, and this is uh, apparently word for word what happened claims that he got in a fight with Lunsford which resulted in both of his wrists being slashed yeah I don't believe that yeah, yeah. the other side of the story is that um, uh, uh, Speck immediately downed a quart of vodka smashed the bottle and tried to then carve both of yeah, his wrists yeah he, he saw no way out he thought this was, this was it and he thought you know I'm going to go by, by, go by my own hands and he easily his wrists um, and, but he was rushed to hospital yeah, so uh, uh, hotel staff at the Star Hotel um, immediately call uh, for an ambulance and he, he is admitted to hospital um, where um, Dr. Leroy Smith, um, a 25-year-old surgical resident physician, um, read about the Born to Raise Hell tattoo on Speck's wrist, um, noticed it there and immediately called police. Yeah, so well done that man. So, so Speck was then arrested but not charged for three weeks. Yeah, and, and partly uh, part of this were due to concerns over the recent Miranda case that had vacated the convictions of a number of criminals, which meant Speck was not even questioned for three weeks. So this is, uh, you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to this, yep. you have the right to that. Um, so the Miranda case itself was kind of pivotal in that movement being you know, yep. in terms of consent. Well, it's like now in police in twenty four hours in police custody, which is a great show. Yeah, you've, good watch. you've got you've got twenty four hours, and then that's it. So yeah. you can't just go. You're in prison for three weeks, and then we figure it out. After this three week period, they finally do get Spec out of hospital and into custody, um, wherein he's still kind of. I think his in, his gut reaction is to try and kind of play the old um, insane card. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but he, he's got um, three doctors looking looking into him, look, talking to him, speaking to him. One of them was Dr. Marvin Saporin. And there's an odd story I, I found with this, with, with Saporin kind of encouraged Speck to you know, show his creativity and paint and do things like that. And so he was painting away and his prosecutor came in and he was shocked to see what Speck had painted. When I was watching the documentary, I was like, oh, he's not painted, you know, nurses, like mm. the, the scene. But he's like, to my shock, he painted a leopard. I was like, well, that's not really that, that bad, is it? Mm. And, like, and to me, Speck was a leopard. I was like, well, he's like, you shouldn't be painting those kind of things. You should paint a Bambi. And apparently two weeks later, he painted a Bambi. Oh. And there's a picture, there's a picture of it. Any good? <laughs> it's not, not bad, not bad. But I just thought that the guy was trying to really curb in there. An analogy, therefore, he's a leopard. And, like, that's, no. well, that's, and we'll get on to Zipporin uh, in a little more detail as well, but he did not come across well in this documentary and he won't come across well in this case. Speck would actually have, he had quite a nice setup when he was in the prison as well, talking to the doctors. He had a hot plate in there, he'd make coffee for him and Dr. Marvin Zipporin, mm -hmm. but things were getting leaked to the press slightly. Yeah. And, he, and Speck would get the papers as well. And one of the headlines said about Speck being a monster. And when Zipporin was in there, Speck actually got, had a razor blade to his neck. 
He said, if I'm such a monster as everyone seems to think I am, why don't I just kill you now? And Saporin says this. I don't think he said this in the way he suggested he said it, because <laughs> he's so badass. He's like, well, you aren't drunk and you haven't got eight redbirds in you. And Speck replied, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> that definitely didn't happen to Saporin. hundred yeah. percent. Like, he wouldn't <sighs> be so cocky with the response. Didn't happen of the year award Twitter yeah. account. It's, yeah. it's, it's one of those, yeah, it's... I mean, as we said, Speck, when he has a knife on him, you know, he's a different character and he, you know, he wants to be seen as a bad guy, but he's quite easily manipulated not to be. But yeah, it, it just seems a lot. Yeah, I don't believe it. Yeah. On Dr. Zipporin then, he was responsible for most of the Speck summary um, that they wanted to see if he would be fit for trial. Um, now, uh, uh, Zipporin was not allowed to be used for the defence or the prosecution when it was discovered uh, and both sides were were troubled to learn that on the sly, Zipporin had been actually writing a book about Spec uh, 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 for financial gain. So Zipporin was removed from the case. Um, he also um, earned the ire of Cook County Jail, who fired him as their part-time psychiatrist when this was discovered. Um, part-time psychiatrist, part-time author. However, during his interviews with Speck, Zipporin had obtained a written free sentence consent form from Speck, authorizing him to tell what I'm really like. Um, so Zipporin would write a biography of Speck, which was published the following year in 1967. So um, Speck had confessed the crime to Dr. Leroy Smith at the Cook County Hospital, but Smith did not testify because the confession was made while Speck was sedated. Dr. Zipporin as well said he would go in and speak, he'd speak hypothetically to Speck. He'd say, okay, let's say, let's say this wasn't you that did it. Even though you've been recognised, you know, you've been pointed out, let's say it wasn't you. He's like, well, it was me. <laughs> he was given like an opportunity to kind of like lie and he's like, he would just seem to be like, no, this is done. Okay. The, uh, end of the road. He, I think he, well, it's been speculated maybe he enjoyed the kind of, he's in prison now, things were calmer, he could see, you know, he had routine. Stability. He, yeah, stability. Yeah. And he, yeah, he didn't need to kind of haggle and blag his way to his next meal. I'm tired of running. Could have been. He, he could have said that. Hypothetically, because yeah. he was in on the hypothetics of the situation. For, mo for most of this kind of, the following couple of weeks stated that it were maintained that he was high and too drunk to remember what happened. That's, a, that's an excuse he did use previously quite a lot of times. I was, I was blacked out, I was drunk, I didn't know what I did. This is just, this is just such a, Cop out. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. If we were doing, uh, you know, our, our, our typical timeline, um, at this point, we'd go to the 30th of July, 1966. England win the World Cup. There you go. Come on, England. <laughs> April 3rd, 1967, Specs jury trial begins. Um, and there is a gag order on press being allowed anywhere near this this case. So in court, Speck was positively identified by the sole surviving nurse, uh, Corazon Amaral. And this is pretty powerful, this moment. Yes. Um, the prosecutor, he was, was sure she maybe she would look sheepishly over there and point at him. But she actually went over there to his face and, and said it, it was him, it was him. Yeah. Um, it was also said by the, um, by the defense team of Speck that he suddenly turned into that cowering little boy again. He didn't have his protection, didn't have his knife. He was sitting there, he was very shy, he didn't feel comfortable, he looked very uh, nervous and agitated. Um, it, and she's she's seen him being, you know, the, the guy who's got all the nurses tied up, talking to them, laughing them with a cigarette in his hand, to now turning into the shell of his, his, himself. Yeah. But as well as this, uh, which was a, a powerful enough victim statement, her pointing him out, uh, Lieutenant Emil Gies uh, testified regarding the fingerprints uh, found in the, in the dormitory that they positively matched a uh, spec from his semen days. April 15th, 1967, after 49 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Speck guilty and recommended the death penalty. Um, on June the 5th uh, that year, Judge Herbert J. Passion sentenced Speck to die via the electric chair, but granted an immediate stay pending automatic appeal, which just to me seems like... Well, is it one or is it the other? Yeah. You know, it's, that's that's generous. Um, the Illinois Supreme Court subsequently upheld his conviction and death sentence. Um, so they were having none of it. And they they recommended the death penalty as well. Well, that, it's such a big case. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, when between the... the um, the crime and and him being caught, he was America's most America's most wanted man. Yeah, the um, crime of the century. Exactly, and people wanted him to be 
to suffer. Yeah, to suffer, to be, to be killed. They wanted, they wanted justice to be served and the death penalty seemed to be the way to go. Yeah, now <clears throat> all the anger associated with Speck and associated with this case may have actually in turn done Speck some favours because on June 28th of 1971, the US Supreme Court upheld Speck's conviction but reversed the death sentence because more than 250 potential jurors um, were unconstitutionally excluded from the jury because of their conscientious or religious beliefs against capital punishment. Um, they were also viewed as not being impartial enough to take place yeah. in the trial. Um, so the case was remanded back to the Illinois Supreme Court for resentencing. So that would eventually result in the US Supreme Court declaring the death penalty unconstitutional um, so they then uh, sentenced Spec or resentenced Spec to a sentence of four hundred to twelve hundred years in prison. Yeah, he was denied parole seven times. So yeah, four hundred to twelve hundred years. Um, Non-specific. You'd be, you'd be surprised to learn he only served for six hundred of those years. <laughs> so what we saying before about Spec saying this? Oh, I was drunk. I can't remember this. This is a direct quote he said to an interview with Bob Green at Statesville Prison. He said. It was just one of them weird coincidences. I was hiring heroin that night. Heroin and whiskey. I'd never shot heroin before, so eight people got killed. Just so blasé oh, about yeah. it. So it wasn't me, it was the heroin. Yeah. Deary me. Um, and this is where it gets all all kinds of interesting. So the the video of Spec that ref we referenced right at the start of the episode that kind of was the first thing that put me onto this case is an interview that was kind of conducted on the sly, I believe, or footage that was obtained on the sly, rather, because the interview was actually... In in the video, yeah, he's, he's, he's doing um, lines of coke. He's also performing sexual acts on another prisoner. So when he was first put into the prison cell, obviously um, paedophiles or people that harm women are hated in prison. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're usually what, what be who people target. And there was, there was no different in that in that time there. When he was first put into prison, other, other prisoners would be saying they're going to kill him, they're going to do this and that. And he was terrified because he didn't have his knife, he didn't have the twenty two caliber, he was just him. So he he was moved for his own safety to the isolation cells. Whilst in the isolation cells, he asked if he could possibly paint his cell, which is an odd, odd request to do. Hmm. Um, and they're like, yeah, of course. So they let him paint his cell. And they're like, he did such a good job, they let him paint the whole isolation unit. And whilst doing that, with this little bit of freedom he has, because Speck, he just can't just do things without having to try and do a little petty scam. Yeah, he can't do anything in moderation. No, he's like, okay, I'm going to start smuggling cigs. And also he started hiding raisins in jars in the piping and then the ferment so he could drink his own supply. So he was, very, he was always drunk off his own supply. So he was painting and drinking and that's where he got the name the Drunken Painter of Stateville. There you go. There you go. I did not know that. When it was changed from he was no longer on death row and he was being moved, to, you know, he's just being a lifer. That's when he moved into the new cells and that's where this change, like Ben said, happened. Yeah. Now, another nickname, just, just before we get to this very interesting change, another nickname that he obtained was um, the Birdman. Um, and this was after uh, Speck had basically adopted two young sparrows that had flown into his cell. Um, he was described as a loner who kept to himself. He also kept a stamp collection and enjoyed listening to music. Um, now, there's a scene in, uh, in Mindhunter. Mindhunter where he has one of the sparrows, and if he, he, he makes a statement, uh, if I can't have them, no one can, boom, and throws the sparrows into a, an oscillating fan. Um, I think that was just... I think that was for, yeah, that was for the thing. show. Uh, but he was—he kept himself to himself. His contacts with the warden included res requests for new shirts, a radio, and other mundane items. The warden merely described him as a big nothing doing time. Um, Speck was not a model prisoner, as Tom said. He was—he uh, was often caught with drugs or distilled moonshine, raisin-based uh, moonshine. Um, punishment for such infractions never stopped him. Uh, Speck was uh, said to have. Uh, stated, how am I going to get in trouble? I'm here for 1,200 years. Yeah, they're not going to extend his time. <clears throat> but as we said, with Speck and with the crimes he committed and even the fame of Speck, he was kind of very much a target. Um, but it appears that he was being targeted for other reasons um, because he was very kind of passive and, uh, he, and he would also just the people would take advantage of him or, you know, pressuring him to doing things. The videotapes that were leaked or put out there it shows him in a situation where he essentially is the, is the prison 
Queen bee. Queen bee is the term where where basically men would go and uh, well, it, I guess it's, it would, it would, would rape him. Uh, but he made he, that's essentially what happened. But he, he he made it so he was as, as appealing as possible to the men, yeah. in order for him to stay safe to survive. Yes. So thirty years after the nurses' deaths, uh, Chicago television news anchor Bill Curtis received videotapes made at Stateville Correction Center in nineteen eighty eight. So the footage is a little bit scratchy, um, but you can still see enough. Trust me. Um, they were made. Uh, public and uh, the video showed explicit scenes of sex, drug use and money being passed around by prisoners who seemingly had no fear of being caught. Now when they are when they're interviewing Speck he's sat at a chair initially fully clothed and he's got a fairly bulky uh, prisoner wearing sunglasses sat next to him who seems to be the kind of alpha in in this situation. Um, Whilst doing this Speck is clearly um, sniffing lines of coke off this other, yeah, other prisoner's yeah. um, leg, um, and uh, at one point the prison, the other prisoners force him. Well, not force him; they just ask him, and he does it, and he complies. Yeah, he asks him if, if he's wearing the blue panties today, and then he just takes off his trousers and shows that, and he takes off his top, and uh, he reveals a change in his body shape. Um, he had been smuggling in um, hormone uh, boosters, or hormone, who- hormone boosters, and he's basically had developed breasts. As we said, he was trying to make himself be as appealing to the men as possible. And that is something that he decided to do to help him survive. Yeah, and I, I feel like at this point he's he's got to say things like this to stay safe and 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 appear confident in this video and appear confident in front of um, other other workers. But he he says, oh, if they know, if only they knew how much fun I was having, they'd turn me loose. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's he. Do, he's all about bravado in yeah. his whole life. It's been getting that getting the tattoo, raise hell. He does that, and he's like, "Okay, now I have to live by that. I'll, I'll look stupid if I don't live by that. I'll, I'll live that way." It's been it's been speculated maybe one of the first times he went to prison that you know he was very much a victim. Maybe he got abused the first time, yeah. right? and then maybe yeah. that's what actually led him to then commit the rapes because he was like, yes. "I've been I've been assaulted. This is I'm going to get back on people. I've been I'll... a victim. Now you're going to be a victim." Exactly. But he's here. He's literally gone. The only way I'm going to survive this because I'm such a well known prisoner is by allowing these men to abuse me and rape me. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's trying to play it off to the camera as if I'm having the time of my life. I've always yeah. I've always liked this. Well, I, this is, it's a really bizarre twist to the tale. He was either going to be executed or he had a lifetime spent of being raped by other men uh, in this prison, claiming to have fun. I know there's a lot of uh, controversy coming out when the videotapes came out. They, yeah. they were angry seeing that he was able to live that lifestyle and, well, yeah. and seem happy. I mean, the cocaine probably helped him. Yeah. Um, um, but... I think anyone would be kidding themselves if they thought that he was happy there. Um, the prison was also, in his lifetime, it's it the highest rank he had in life in terms of he was known. He was known as Richard Speck, the, killed, yeah. the guy that killed all the nurses, the guy that, all this thing. Uh, William M- Martin, the prosecutor, said, if a hurricane blew down the prison, Speck is the only one that would not walk away because he was happy there. He was content in terms of... Wow. <laughs> but, as I said, a lot of bravado in, in, in terms of Speck. And I don't, I don't know how happy he was there. But. Yeah, I mean, from behind the camera, another prisoner asked Speck if he had killed the nurses. Speck responded, um, sure I did. Uh, when asked why, Speck simply shrugged and jokingly said, it just wasn't their night. When asked how he felt about himself in the years since, he said, like I have always felt, had no feeling. If you're asking me if I felt sorry, no. He then also described in detail the experience of strangling someone, stating, it's not like TV, it takes over three minutes and you have to have a lot of strength. So on December 5th, 1991, Speck was transported from Stateville Correctional Center to Silver Cross Hospital in Illinois after complaining of severe chest pains. Um, Speck would lay... Two severe chest pains. (laughs) Dear me. Later... In the day, Speck uh, died um, of what was believed to have been a heart attack. Well, his dad died at 53 of a heart attack, and he yeah. died a day before his 50th birthday, I do believe. There you go. Yeah, so 49 at the time of dying, looked about 60. The coroner stated Speck had an enlarged heart, emphysema, and clogged arteries, which most likely contributed to his fatal heart attack. His sister feared that his grave would be desecrated, so he does not have a physical resting place. Speck was cremated and his ashes were scattered in a secret location that only two people know, presumably one being his sister. 
So after he passed, Speck's autopsy found apparent gross abnormalities. Two areas of the brain, the, he- the hippocampus, it's also a band name, which involves memory, and the amygdala, which deals with rage and other strong emotions, encroached upon each other, and the boundaries were blurred. Yeah, so this was linked, well, uh, um, an unofficial diagnosis of organic brain syndrome, which just sounds like kind of free words that you threw together and it sounds okay. However, that was not uh, speci- uh, officially diagnosed, should we say. So it was uh, speculated that Speck's homicidal nature to, was a combination of brain abnormalities from the violence Speck suffered at the hands of the alcoholic stepfather and his own drinking and violence in Texas. The memory thing might be a thing he didn't remember it, but obviously years of, of drinking since he was 12. Definitely didn't help. Abusing drugs for the whole time. Also all, didn't help. All these things would, would come into play, I'm sure. Yeah. And essentially he's made some very, very bad choices that have escalated and escalated yeah. and escalated. I mean, in terms of motive for this, I, th- I think the motive probably was to rob that place. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. I think he, he might have even planned, if, if he did plan to go there and, and rape one and then two more people came in, he might have been like, I need to kill the witnesses. Yeah. It, it, I th- it felt like he just completely just panicked and he, the spree killing wasn't something he planned to do. Saying that though, when he was younger, he didn't he'd... fire a bullet, did he? He had the gun. He could have just. But then, then people would hear. Uh, yeah. But so earlier on in Speck's life, he did say a couple of times about the headlines. I'll make headlines one day. Yeah. Which is quite chilling. Thinking they went on to do this. I mean, maybe he did it for notoriety, but I just think everything seems to point to it got there. It got out of hand. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to be his life just seems so, so bizarre. A story and a half, I tell you. A story and a half, I tell you. I'll, I'll tell you as well, because we're both did. We're telling the story together. Exactly. And that was the case of Richard Speck. Um, we've got some trivia bits about him as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, should you, would you like to kick us off, Tom? His last name was referenced in the stage name of Zaza Zaza Speck, a one-time keyboardist to Marilyn Manson. Yeah, so apparently a, a, number, a, a number of the band members um, adopt certain elements of serial killer names. Cheap Tricks 1977 self-titled debut album contains a song about Speck called The Ballad of TV Violence. Um, the song was originally titled The Ballad of Richard Speck, but according to drummer Bunny Carlos, uh, Bun E Carlos, nice. Um, the legal department said we could call it that if we wanted, but the estate will sue and you'll have to give all your royalties to them. Can't profit from a crime and all that. They also had a song called Born to Raise Hell. Although the link to Specs Tattoo is unconfirmed, but I think it kind of indicates that's probably yeah. the link. Simon and Garfunkel also had a song called The Seven O'Clock News, which was comprised of several radio broadcasts being read against the soothing Silent Night. And a segment from a news story was involved in that around, around Spec. In season one, episode two of FX American Horror Story, two young nurses are held hostage and killed by a home invader. Sorry if you haven't watched that show. I haven't. I can't get past the credit sequence. It terrifies me. Um, But in any case, show creator Ryan Murphy has said that the storyline was inspired by Speck's murders. German artist Gerhard Richter, uh, he did a painting called Eight Student Nurses in 1966 as well, which will pop up here now. Um... Yeah, it seemed to. It was big news all around the world, and it's obviously dripped into the mainstream media and and, and the creative world as well. Yeah, and I mean, exactly leading on from what Tom's just said, uh, Robert F. Kennedy rhetorically cited Specs Knife as one of many American products counted by the United States gross domestic product in his March 1968 speech at the University of Kansas. So RFK speaking about Speck. Yeah, it's very, very bizarre. We'll do our lucky likeys now, Ben. Yes. This is the. I feel two very rogue shouts from me. Yeah. I, I'm going to stand by them. Okay, fantastic. So well, when he was younger. Yes, he yeah, looked, we've got a young speck and old speck. He looked like young. He looked like Stinky Peterson from Hey Arnold. Just yeah. show Ben a picture there. Yeah, that's, that's solid. Yeah, and when he's older, Graham Potter from Brighton. Oh, wow. I've got a football manager as well. <laughs> So I'll start with that. Go on. Um, older spec, um, Brendan Rogers. <laughs> okay. The nose mainly. Um, older spec as well. He's got the same haircut, the exact same haircut as Gerard Depardieu. Yeah. Um, the actor from Green Card, my favourite movie of all time. Is it? Uh, Ben's Ben trivia. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, but my good one, which I feel like I should probably... Uh, well, he also looks like uh, the evil, or slightly more evil, depending on your American politics, uh, brother of Ted Cruz. Okay. But my good one, and this is my strongest one, pu- well, I already mentioned Punch out, Punch and Judy. Yeah, that wasn't... Uh, we, we can put that one in the, in the not-so-strong part. Okay. But this is the one I feel like I'm going to have to get a photo out for Tom. Um, but there was a band in the... Uh, 60s and 70s called Mickey Hawks and the Night Raiders Band. I think your other ones were better. That's just a guy. Just in a guy with an old haircut. But there you go. Um, <laughs> that's so good. Well, I think that's pretty good, actually, Ben. I'm Thank you, back mate, up so much. Just Google it in the same. Any of them, actually. Put in, put Any of them. <laughs> mainly the middle one. <laughs> the middle one is the one, yeah. Yeah. Johnny Rotten vibe as well, but yeah. Well, can you well, let us know. Do you want to reconsider, Tom? Nope. Let us know in the comments below what you think of that. Yeah. I think of the looky likes. We always, um, like, we always like to hear what your guys' opinion is. Yeah. I mean, they're also very, very, very quickly um, a couple of movies. Um, obviously, we talked about Spec uh, being in Mindhunter or portrayed in Mindhunter. Mm-hmm. Um, there was also a movie called Chicago Massacre. Um, which was based in 2007 on the Richard Speck case, uh, but done in kind of a horror horror film style. There was also 100 Ghost Street, The Return of Richard Speck. Wow. Um, that sounds a terrible movie. Yes. Uh, and um, that is all I have for you. Obviously, the Birdman reference as well. There was also the Birdman of Alcatraz. And that was the case of Richard Speck. Um, what was his amazing nickname? The Drunken Painter of Stateville. The Drunken Painter of Stateville. Um, we hope you enjoyed this week's episode. We appreciate it. It's a pretty, oh well, it's a pretty out there one. Um, lots going on, lots to think about, lots of thoughts, lots of feelings. We appreciate you for sticking with us. We appreciate you as well um, for leaving a like because you're gonna. Please, <laughs> please. If you, if, you, if, you, if you enjoyed the episode, give us a like. Don't forget to subscribe. Follow us on our socials as well because we do a daily kind of fact about different yeah. cases. And things Some we interesting find. ones about this case. As exactly, well. yeah. yeah. So get involved. We also do requests. Um, me and Tom, uh, put some money in the hat and we will play your favourite song. No, I'm joking. Of course I'm joking. That wouldn't make sense. We have a Patreon page. We will do requests uh, in terms of episodes and cases. Yeah, we, we tend to do Minnesota, so it tends to be a smaller case. Not, obviously you couldn't do this kind of case in yeah. a bit in it. What have we got on there at the moment? Purple Aki. Um, the creepiest love story ever told. Uh, the most polite serial killer of all time. They've, yeah, they're a bit more out there kind of with the titles. But let yeah. us know um, if we think it's, it makes sense. We, we will definitely, definitely do it. But go. thank you so much for watching. And like we always say. We say this a lot and all the time as well. Always check Richard Speck. That's it. Perfect. See you later. See you guys. <laughs>